So, <clears throat> as I said, we are going to have a session with Michael Hastings. Lord Michael Hastings is a phenomenal figure. He's a, a mentor. He is a friend. Um, he's a confidence to me. And it's been an amazing, amazing experience learning from him. And I think you guys will learn from him as well. Um, he has many, many, many accolades as you guys would have seen. He's currently um, uh, a House of Lord Peer. He's, he was also previously the Global Head of Citizenship at KPMG. Uh, and also he was, he's currently the Chancellor of Bridget's University. And he's also the public of, the head, the public, the head of public affairs at the BBC. So, I know you guys are waiting for to see him. So, Lord Hastings, uh, please turn your camera on. Please unmute yourself and let everyone see who it is. Um, Hi, Sam. Hello, hello, hello. So, um, tell us about your story. You know, um, tell us about when you was younger, the the career journey that you've had um, from your first job. You know, not not too long, but from your first role to becoming a lord. You know. Lord of, I can't, I still struggle to say the place. Scarisbrick. Scarisbrick. Lord of Scarisbrick. That's, that's how you know I'm not, <laughs> I'm a Londoner. I don't know anywhere else except from London. <laughs> yeah, you should be forgiven. Man. Um, <laughs> and um, some of the key milestones in that, in that journey, I think, um, I think a lot of people have really interested in you know, hearing your story and journey. So yeah, take it away. Um, okay. I'll give it as quick as I can. So born in the north of England in a little town called Widnes, which is extremely unexciting. Uh, and very dull place. You never ever, ever want to go there. Not even if somebody paid you. And then at the <laughs> age of at the age of uh, eight, it was my father's uh, great desire that we move. My brother, myself, my father, my mother. We move to Jamaica. Um, my father was a dental surgeon. Jamaica had been independent for a couple of years, and um, the government, both the British government and the Jamaican government, were offering for those who had previously worked in Jamaica to come back. My father had worked in Jamaica, and so uh, he wanted to go back to be a dental surgeon and serve the people. That's what we did in 1966. Um, we took a very long three-week boat to get there, um, mm. and it was a wonderful experience. I remember Jamaica as an incredibly peaceful and dynamic and warm and beautiful place. And then in 1970, which I know, Sam, is a long time ago, in 1970... Uh, the people of Jamaica made what, a democratically... When you were using pigeons. <laughs> Pigeon. No, pigeons. Uh, okay? <laughs> the people of Jamaica made a disastrous political decision and voted for a government that was in mm. favor of Cuba, which meant being in favor of what was then what we used to call Russia, the USSR, which meant the Americans turned on the place. And I witnessed very quickly within 12 months this incredibly bright and beautiful and energetic country. I, I witnessed people leave on droves. Anybody who had money left. They took it all out. The economy collapsed. The poor became desperate. Homelessness was acute. You couldn't get stuff in the shops. And violence emerged onto the streets. And I remember as a child watching, watching a man with a machete hack into a young man on the street and actually wow. aim to kill him. And I saw that with my own eyes at the age of 11. Wow. And uh, our parents decided that my brother and I needed to be sent away. So um, uh, we were sent to boarding school in Scarisbrick Hall, which is why I'm Lord Hastings mm. of Scarisbrick. Sent yeah. to Scarisbrick Hall in Lancashire, um, 1972. Never looked, never went back. I mean, apart from holidays to see mum and dad. Um, mm. My father died when I was 16. He died in a car crash in Jamaica. And our mother was just adamant that, you know, for my brother and I, the journey of life is about moving forward. So... Uh, she whipped us back very quickly for the funeral, sent us away two days later um, to go back to school because life has to be about the future, not about the past, and don't hang around fretting about death. Uh, and I then went to um, I then went on to theological college, and uh, I got a very ropey two two. So I, this is to encourage to anybody who's got a two two degree. If you think that's the end of life, it isn't. It's, uh, <laughs> You can become a lord. I, yeah, well, look at that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, and other things. So I got a tutu from uh, London School of Theology. I then trained as a teacher. Um, but before I went into teaching, I worked in a youth club in the north of Wales where I was the toilet cleaner. And I like to tell that story truthfully because it was the first job I was ever paid to do. 
was to clean the toilets, the, the girls' toilets and the boys' toilets, and I had to clean them four or five times every day. And uh, that, that was the job. And you need to start on your knees, so you stay on your knees until somebody calls you upwards. I taught uh, for a number of f- five years, and then a strange thing happened. And I'll just tell you this, and then you know, the journey you can take me on from there. Well, a strange thing happened, a phone call, mm. half term. It was, I remember it very well. It was a uh, Wednesday morning. No, Tuesday morning. It was Tuesday morning. And it was a phone call from someone from Downing Street. And I had not spoken to this person whose name was Hartley Booth for six years. Mm. We'd only ever met really once. And, um, but, you know, we liked each other, but he, he became a senior political figure, became one of Margaret Thatcher's advisors. And what many of your watchers won't remember, because they wouldn't have been around, was that in 1981 and 1986, 85, there were a string of riots. You remember those big Brixton riots and Toxis yeah, yeah, riots and you know, Birmingham, Moss Side and all that? 21 cities in the UK went up in flames because black men and women were angry and there wasn't work and, and people rioted. And these riots were long. These were long. And the Thatcher government was desperate to find a solution and they needed help. And this guy rang me up and he said, the prime minister has asked you to come in mm. to help us. Now there was, I'd just been a teacher. I was half term. I was just mm. preparing lessons. And I get this phone call to go into number 10. And so at the age of 25, I'm in 10 Downing Street, wow. 26, I'm in 10 Downing Street. And there I am being asked to lead a complete national transformation. And I resigned my school position immediately um, because it was for the government. I was allowed to go immediately. And I started work on employment renewal initiatives all across 21 places across the UK. Did that for five years, loved it, then got called into television. And then the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, how, when, when you had that phone call, how, like, what was going for your, well, yeah, what was going for your man? And someone's up by their tree, like, what was the exact thoughts? And, 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 if okay. and, if and if a swear word, swear, don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> Sam, I'd never swear in such a great presence as yours. <laughs> um, so, okay, Hannah, I noticed, asked, why did they choose me? And here is the straight answer. To so my friend, Hartley Booth, I said to him, why are you calling me? And he said this, Margaret Thatcher gathered her whole cabinet, all her advisors, and she asked this question. Find us somebody black. Who here knows anybody black who can help us to to actually take down the temperature of this street aggression and build future jobs and build economy and give people hope? And I suppose in that one encounter that I'd had with that man six years earlier, I'd left an impression on him. Mm. And that's a really important lesson, Sam which I share with all of you, which is, um, you know, it's, it's a principle of forensic science. Yeah. All of us leave impressions on other people. Mm. We can either leave people with hope and light, or we can leave them with some kind of desperate wounding in their soul. Mm. And all of us leave an impression. So if we're going to meet people, let's make sure that when they leave us, they say that was good to have those mm. few minutes for that person. So yeah. I thank God I left an impression on that man. And he carried it for six years. That's incredible, man. So I'm going to move on now to kind of like present day and like, but, um, and you know, what you, what, you, what you do at the moment, how you've been working with your lordship and, and what does that actually tell? What, what, does, it, what does it mean? Well, um, so a quick update from after working for Margaret Thatcher's government, I then worked at the BBC as a broadcaster. Uh, and then got called to um, in, to go behind the camera. So I was doing a political program on BBC Two every Sunday called Around Westminster. Um, and then they called me behind the camera and they said, would you head up our public affairs division, be our chief lobbyist in yeah. Westminster? So that led me to get to know lots of politicians. And I was always around lots of politicians of every type. Um, and really to persuade them of the value of the BBC, which I believe in very strongly. And... Um, that ultimately led to one very senior politician one day ringing me up and saying, we want to offer you, in fact, his name was Paddy Ashdown, who was leader of the Liberal Democrats, and he rang up and he said, Michael, we want to offer you a peerage, a membership to the House of Lords. And Tony Blair, the Prime Minister, is willing to send a letter to the Queen on your behalf to put you forward. Mm. And I said, no. 
I said, no, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, first of all, Paddy, um, it doesn't pay because it doesn't. It's not a job. It doesn't have a salary. I work full time for the BBC. Uh, I can't be politically aligned, so I can't be linked to your party. You're a great friend, but I can't take it. Mm -hmm. He was really disappointed in me. I mean, who turns that down? And I said, well, I can't do it. And then about a year and a half passed and I got asked again by uh, some senior politicians and I went, met them for lunch and they offered me again a political route and I said, no, I can't do it. And then I thought, well, that's the end of that. You know, you turn these <laughs> things down twice. That's the yeah, end of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, don't bother you again. <laughs> they're not going to bother me again. And then the prime minister at that point, Tony Blair, set up this independent appointments commission whose job it was to find people. They said, people of merit. Well, they made a mistake and they found me. But they, um, <laughs> you might, by faith. By well, faith. I, I, think, I think, again, that masking of the hair. But they found me and they um, came to me and they said, well, you know, a lot of people have talked about you and would you be willing to serve in Parliament? And I said, of course, not, as long as it's independent yeah. and it's not politically aligned. Because in the House of Lords, there are five categories of laws, just to help, help your wonderful friends who are on worth of mouth understand this. There are five categories of lords and ladies. First of all, there are the bishops of the Church of England, 26. There are the judges of the Supreme Court. So any ones of those are law lords. Then there are princes of the royal family who are entitled to attend. Plus there are political members, Labour, Conservative, Liberal Democrat, Green, whatever it is. And then there are independent members. So I'm an independent member. There are about 200 of us. Um, mm. We actually hold the balance. And uh, uh, you know, we, we actually make sure that the House of Lords operates for the key principle that it's meant to be there for. Yes, challenging the government, holding the government to account, improving legislation, making sure the right thing is done for everyone, but also yeah. at the same time, upholding the constitution, which in this case in the country is unwritten. And I have many proud moments of when we fought in the House of Lords to stop MPs doing things that were dangerous. You know, and your next question is going to be, is going to be like what? Give me an example. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I'm going to give, I'm, I'm, you see, I preempted your question, sir. I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to give you an example because I, I'm reading your mind. Uh, I'm going to give you this example. So I will never forget this. This is when David Cameron was prime minister. Do you remember him? Do you remember him? No. When David Cameron was prime <laughs> And uh, his chancellor was George, <laughs> George Osborne, who was not a bad guy, although he came up with a bad idea, which was to make access to benefits really, really punishingly, uncomfortably tough for pregnant girls. Mm. And you know, Sammy, MPs passed it. Yeah. And it came to us in the House of Lords and we said, no, no. This is inappropriate, unjust, unfair. We're not going to stand for this. You know, it, it's quite right to challenge the fact that people shouldn't sponge off the state, but it's another thing to punish them when they're in a state where they need help. Mm -hmm. So we fought it. And on one day, I remember voting three times against the government. And the majority of members of the House of Lords voted three times and the government threatened us. And they said, wow. if, you, if you turn this down, <laughs> we're going to reform the House of Lords. We're going to remove this, move that. And we said, bring it on. <laughs> anyway, it got rejected. It got thrown out. And so it never happened. Yeah. And sometimes the public don't realize that we fight for things in the silence. And that's what I really believe is the honor of that position. But the last thing I'd say about it is this, which is, because I get the privilege to use my title, my position, yeah. I can write letters to people in very senior positions in government. Yeah. And it's amazing. They respond. So I defend people. Yeah. I write references for guys in prison. And it helps them to get to their CCAT and to get to their, room, to get to their exit. I defend people using that position. So I thank God for it. Because it's a privilege. Uh, but it's also more than anything else, a chance to serve. Uh, two, two steps. Like, where, how, how, does, how did that make, how, like, at what point did you ever, have you ever felt different? At what point did, have you ever felt um, like you had a, a role to play because of, you know, because of who you was and, and, your, and, your, and your race? And also, why do you think there is such a lack of diversity within senior positions like yours? 
I think, yeah, those are the two, yeah, two questions I'd ask. Well, you know, Sam, there are so many times when I've gone into rooms and spaces and I go, oh, me again, uh, no one else. <laughs> and you look around and you see uh, that it just, it just looks like the unfamiliar. Hmm. But then you, have to, then you have to make a decision. Um, do I get all uptight about being the only one in the room? Or do I pull others into the room with me? Mm. Now, you know that because I've taken you places. And it's been important to say, come here with me. Come, come see what this is like. Come join this group, this network. Come to this event. So it's important that if you get to the opportunity to be somewhere, you take other people with you. And you never exclude them. You know, I made the decision as a young man that I would never, and I'm just, this may sound controversial to some, mm. but I would never be bothered by my color. Mm. I wouldn't let race bother me. I would be furious yeah. about discrimination, injustice, uh, picking on people because they're different, and I would defend the justice rights of all, and I continue to do that. But if someone is going to kind of point at me because mm. I'm brownish rather than whitish, well, let mm. them do it. But I'm mm. here. I'm here. And you know, by the, I suppose by the, um, the opportunities of service. Yeah. You know, so I, I was 21 years as a trustee and chairman of Crime Concern, which created Neighborhood Watch and, um, oh. uh, and uh, so many other, we, many, many of your friends will know Catch-22. We created Catch-22. We created victim support. Uh, we created so many mechanisms of allowing communities to feel safer. And I was blessed to be offered a CBE, which is a great honor. Uh, so, you know, the Queen kind of put it on me and said a few great words. And um, the what British Royal Commando. Command of the British Empire. I mean, yeah. there is still a, still a little bit of it left. Um, so I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can walk into you can walk into a different country. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You choose to join the queue; it's the best thing to do. Uh, but to be, <laughs> be a commander, of the, I mean, and I didn't expect that, but it came. Uh, and then when the period, you know, the offers to be a lord came, and they all come mm. because people realise that you're serious about the things you're contending for. Mm. And if you fight a fight of justice for others and expand your energy on that battle. Mm. And people notice. So it never bothered me to be the one black person in the room. I just draw others like I've drawn you and many others. And uh, that's, that is the joy we have to serve mm. each other. And Sam, there's one thing I remember clearly during one of our many, many meetings and catch-ups mm. and talked about like ensuring that, you know, you focus on the, your character Yes, and and you kind of I think it'd be great to like share that that concept with, with the audience mm. and like and I think it's really powerful because we're living in a time I think well, yeah we, we we are in times that are you know where there I think there there's been the, there's been division but there's also been unity and things are quite fragile and I think it'll be great for you to like, kind of, yeah I guess get get your your thoughts and on change I think everyone I think the, the key word I've heard the most during this period because of the COVID, because of COVID, because of Black Lives Matters, it's, it's the word change and the fact, you know, change needs to happen. What are, yeah, how do you, what are you, what is your approach in, in terms of your mindset to that? Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned character and, I, and let me just go right to that because literally as we are having this conversation now, the final elements of the funeral of John Lewis are taking place in Atlanta and Barack Obama is speaking now. And uh, it's a wonderful, I've been watching it all afternoon and seen President Clinton and President Bush and Nancy Pelosi and a whole series of black historic leaders speaking. Um, and you, to remember that John Lewis, who I said was arrested many times, beaten many times, imprisoned many times because he was standing up for racial justice and for freedom. He was there alongside Martin Luther King in the 1960s. And here we are, mm. 50, we're now 52 years on. Mm from that famous I have a dream speech that Martin Luther King gave. But the, the critical line that is in there, Sam, which must never be forgotten, is that he said, I have a dream that one day my children will be known not for the color of their skin, but for the content of their character. You see, 
quite rightly, because of the outrageous murder of George Floyd, mm. there is a big focus on black lives mattering more than before. And that is right that we maintain a focus on that. Mm. But if that focus turns into aggression and violence and destruction rather than disruption, mm. then we have lost the plot. If we go around just cracking and crashing yeah. rather than building and enabling, we've lost the plot. And Martin Luther King's emphasis, John Lewis's quiet fight, consistently nonviolent, although he was violently beaten. Mm. Nelson Mandela's great nonviolent fight. Gandhi's nonviolent fight. I mean, the fight all the time is one of character. Yeah. Knowing what you believe and standing up for it. Mm. And that, into, and I just encourage your, all your, your watchers today, go, I know this may sound like an odd place to go, but go on to the <laughs> New York Times website. I'll say it again, New York Times website. And there is an essay on there written by John Lewis. Mm. And he wanted it published after his death on the day of his funeral. So there it is. Wow. And he talks about finding the soul of America again and defining the things that matter most about life, which of course are never going to be the possessive, small, commercial, physical things, but more the matters of soul, the importance of the fact that I value you and you value me and that I will expend myself on your behalf and you will seek to do the same that we will, we will see somebody in a desperate state and pick them up. Mm. You know, Jesus spoke very clearly, and I, you and I both follow Jesus, and, and he spoke very clearly about when I was hungry and thirsty, you provided me with food and drink. When I was homeless, you found me a place to rest. When I was in prison, you visited me. These mm. are the defining realities of character. And character is very rarely seen. Can I say yeah. something terribly controversial? <laughs> very rarely seen in the shouting halls of social media mm -hmm. because that's all about promotion, volume and image. But yeah. character is about endurance. Yeah. So as a, as a black man who's been in, you know, been in um, positions where he was a minority, um, imposter syndrome is something that um, I think as, as, as we all go into our, we all accelerate and, and grow. Maybe something we come across, you know, ch trying to enter these leadership positions. Um, what is your thoughts and, 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 and advice for those who, who, who get post syndrome when, you know, when they're in the positions where they feel like they're not meant to be? And then as a result of that, what would you say are the habits and characteristics of an effective leader? And what, what would you, yeah, what would you be your, your, suggestions well imposter syndrome if i may suggest is something that other people impose upon us mm. it shouldn't be something we impose upon ourselves and i think it's very important that every girl and guy watching this accepts the fact that in 2020 you have a right to be where you are and not only just a right it is your responsible duty to be a solid, sound, character-filled representative of what is good and wholesome. So you're not an imposter. In fact, the only place you should be an imposter is where evil and wickedness is being conducted. So find your way, flee from that. But you're not an imposter anywhere else. And it is very important that we don't take on other people's cynicism or criticism mm. about us. We don't hear those negative voices about inadequacy. Yeah, You know, I, I find, I found, I'm 62, I found pretty much all my life, with a few exceptions, I mean, you know, life is tough for everybody at some point, yeah. with a few exceptions, that the vast majority of people are intensely kind. With a few exceptions, but the vast majority are intensely kind. And if we can, here's a habit I learned when I was very young, and actually taught to me by my, my well, it's both my father and actually the head teacher of my school, Ask more questions than you make statements. Mm. Find out about other people. 
So even if you go into a place where you think, why am I here? Am I the right person to be here? Do I, do I feel adequate to be here? Step forward and ask questions. And when you step forward and ask questions and you're the one who's curious and keen, there isn't hardly anybody in the world who doesn't turn. I want to, I want to give you a reply. I don't find that most people ever are really out to do us down. Instead, there's a kind of assumption that if somebody is young and black and looks a bit intimidating, that maybe they are intimidating. Mm. Now, that's not the truth. You know, you, you know, I mean, I actually was talking to you about this earlier today, Sam. You know, I, I spent a lot of time in prison with men on very long, complicated and serious sentences. Yeah. I tell you, they're just amazing guys. Amazing guys. And uh, I'd happily have any of them here in my home. I don't worry about them because other people are getting a label. Yeah. So you're not an imposter unless you allow yourself to be an imposter. You must take cognizance of your duty to stand up as a responsible citizen. Mm. Pull yourself together and realize that there is a fight on. And the fight is not a physical fight. Heaven forbid, that's not what we want. But the fight is a fight for dignity, for the dignity of who you are. There's a fight for your voice to be heard, for you to demonstrate those characteristics of character that we talked about. So when you say, what is a leader? Yeah. I'm going to read you. Can I read you a very tiny quote? Yeah, please do. So, <laughs> given we've been on the theme of... Uh, uh, I'm American the, the, the gems are too much. I'm just saying the gems are too much. I can see everyone... But I'm seeing everyone in chats, man. Thank you for oh, sharing your, your, yeah, your opinions. You can see them all. Love it. So it continues. So, here, here is a quote from Theodore Roosevelt. And I encourage your viewers to look up Roosevelt. One of, I mean, a great political leader. And um, Okay, you ready for this? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's go. It's not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles mm. or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the person who's actually in the arena, whose mm. face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again and spends themselves in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst, if they fail, at least fails while daring greatly, so that their place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Wow. A leader is one who gets on their knees so other people can stand up. Now, I know that's exactly sometimes the reverse of the assumption that the leader is the powerful person in the center or at mm. the front, but we've seen too much of that nasty, vindictive leadership Let's remember something. And again, I say this with the reality of ages <laughs> on my shoulder. Nah, man, what do you You look 35 at most, man. I'm just joking. Oh, you. 34, at man. Most. You got what you've added a year. <laughs> um, Sam, you raise me. Remember this. Remember this. Adolf Hitler was a leader. Mm. The people of Germany voted three times between 1931 and 1933 for him to be the leader of the Third Reich. That led to the Second World War and the slaughter of millions of people. You can be a leader, but mm. for evil. Robert mm. Mugabe mm. was the leader of Zimbabwe for 38 years, and he crushed, killed, and destroyed the country. So having the title leader doesn't mean good, wholesome, purposeful it can often mean commanding and yeah. destructive yeah a leader is one who gets on their knees to allow others to stand that's incredible man here's a quote from from nelson mandel a very important quote he said the time to plant a tree yeah was yesterday it was today. the time to plant a tree again, is today. Yeah, yeah. The purpose of planting trees is so that 
in another generation, those you cannot see will sit in its shade. It's all about being selfless. <laughs> it's about being selfless. So a lot of the young people here, just, uh, most of them were starting their journeys and their careers with the, with, the ambi- with the ambition to become a leader. It could be in the corporate world, it could be um, in, within the entrepreneurial world, or it could be in their personal life, but they want to be a leader. Um, that's, this is, that, that, that goal and dream is here and, and they're here. How, how does someone, yeah, how does someone get, get to that stage now? What can they do now to get them to, to there and um, allow them to, you know, become a leader before they have the title, before they have the income, success? How, how, how does someone mentally prepare themselves to become a leader? Well, you know, Sammy, let me just remind everyone that um, there was a time when I had no titles and I was just playing Michael Hastings, which is wonderful. I had nothing <laughs> cool before name. and nothing. <laughs> well, it's all right. Uh, but I had nothing before and nothing after. Uh, there was a time when my, my job was cleaning toilets and being a school teacher. Mm. You know, I, there was a time when I had no money, no house, no garden. There was a time when I only had 75 pounds left in my account. That was it. I'm not saying there was a savings account, but that was it. Mm. So the reality is we can all go through these things. We should. So here's the, I suppose, three things I would say. First and foremost, and I've tried to live by this principle. Do your job. Whether it's your degree, your studies, your work at home or in the community, your volunteerism, your, your paid work, if you're in the city of London or if you're down around in the corner in the community, do your job. Really do your job. I had to do my job and I built a reputation, I suppose, on just being diligent. Just do your job. And when you do your job, and you've seen this, Sam, with what's happened with you positively in Pearson's, do your job and people notice you do your job mm. and it is equally important if it's voluntary as when it is absolutely something for which you're paid do your job do it diligently do it passionately do it persistently never be late always be early be the more curious one in the room find ways to add extra when i was a school teacher can i just tell this story very quickly Sam? when yeah, i was a school please. teacher do you know what i did i i, I was crazily mad <laughs> about about the fact you that was, I would, or you you know, well, well, I still am. <laughs> <I still have. laughs> no, oh my days! I was, I, was, I, I was crazily mad about uh, the fact that I would go in every single morning to school, and the, and kids because the kids were throwing crisp packets and cans and junk and wrappers and chewing gum. It was all over the place, and you know this was a pretty run, rum dum non effective school in West London. And I used to get sick and tired of this. And after about nine months of being there, I mm. thought, you know something? I went to talk to the head teacher who said, the caretakers have given up. The place is filthy. Mm. So I said, well, you know something? I'm going to clean it up. Mm. So I went out to the equivalent of home base. I bought myself those grabby sticks, a couple of those grabby sticks. I bought some bins, yeah, out of my own money. And I started from the following week going in at 7.30 in the morning. And I cleaned up the site and I did it five days a week. And I, into my third week of cleaning up the school site, a couple of kids said, why are you doing this, sir? And I said, because this mess is unacceptable. Mm. And they asked if they could join me. So I bought a couple more granny sticks and they helped me. And we carried, and then eventually the caretakers thought, mm, maybe we should help. So they kind of helped. And you know something, it took around about four months, but nobody dropped any litter anymore. They put it in the bin. People stop, kids stop writing on the desks and breaking the walls and punching holes into, in, into the toilets and all that because the place was just careless. Mm. So I learned actually that, you know, one of the things about doing your job is find what extra you could do to make a difference. Yeah. What extra can you do to make, do your job, what extra can you do to make a difference and do it and don't ask who pays, you pay. <laughs> Second thing. Get involved in things that change the community beyond you. I started being involved in charities and organizations for when I was 16. Wow. And I've never stopped. 
So join a committee, an organization, give time. Yes, and of course, give money. Give yourself away. Constantly give yourself away. You'll learn things. You'll be fascinated. You'll be curious. You'll be keen. you discover. you understand. I got asked to do so many things because I was doing so many things. And it makes life fascinating. And then my third lesson is with, a, with all that kind of diligent hard work, with all that adding benefit and, as it were, like the bonus to the job, and with all that engaging in other organizations, is build networks of faithful people. Very we need to <laughs> write, that, write that one down. <laughs> build networks of faithful people. Yeah. In other words, you know, look, it's like our relationship, Sam. We, we talk about things that matter deeply in the world and yeah. that matter to us individually, but things that matter. And sad to say, so much of, uh, well, I, let me just put it bluntly. So much of um, youth experience younger than me is about celebrities and personalities and the fatuous emptiness nonsense. Who can be the successful, who can become the successful the, the quickest and the youngest. And what are they wearing and why are they wearing that today and they weren't wearing that yesterday. Who's got the hit out and all that kind of stuff. Build build networks of faithful, good, honorable people. Hmm. I just celebrated yesterday my very dear friend's 81st birthday. Hmm. You know when we met? I was 18. Wow. I was 18. So he's 20 years on from me. And that very kind man chose to mentor me. Mm. And I was blessed for that. And he introduced me to many other men of his age in their 30s and 40s and 50s. Mm. And they've remained precious friends. So build networks of faithful people, positive people, non-cynical people, purpose, purposeful people. They're also fun people too, you know. Yeah. That was incredible. Thank you. Thank you so much. I feel like, um, guys, people who didn't come would have missed out. And I'm sure you guys who were here are very happy you're in your house instead of in the park right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for joining. Um, follow us at Worth of Mouth for more sessions like this. And thank you, Lord, Lord Hastings, for your time, Brisbane. And uh, we all love you dearly. And please keep being an incredible leader. And we hope to be as much the leader as you've been when we grow older. So Honoured, Sam. I love you dearly too. Love you thank too. you. Uh, have a nice weekend, everyone. Have a nice Thursday evening. Enjoy the sun. And bye-bye. Bye.